Hey guys, it's Raquel from the blog Out of the Past, and I'm here today with an AMA style video. So basically I asked on social media for anyone to submit their classic film related questions to me, kind of ask me anything, and I got some really great responses, a lot of um, interesting questions and some really difficult questions too. So the first question comes from Layla at Layla Film, film Fatale on Twitter. Have you watched a classic movie that you felt should have been more popular but was maybe too ahead of its time, risque, etc.? So I really thought about this and I came up with Safe in Hell from 1931. This is a William Wellman pre-code. Um, it stars Dorothy McHale and Donald Cook. And basically this film was released 87 years ago, but it's essentially a Me Too film. Um, I don't think it was appreciated for what it was um, in the just to just to cover the plot really quickly, um, basic Dorothy McHale is a secretary whose um, boss tries to sleep with her, she rejects him, and then he won't let her get any other job, so she has to become a prostitute. And then um, he attacks her, she thinks she killed him, her boyfriend Donald Cook sweeps her off to um, a foreign country, like a Caribbean island, where she can't get extradited, and then um, she just gets... Um, sexually harassed by more men and the dude comes back and goes to find her and things don't end very well. So this is definitely a, a story about um, women and um, how they um, are marginalized in society. It's about, um, um, I mean, it's, it's got a lot, a lot of, it's got like an undercurring feminist message and I don't feel like it would have been really appreciated at the time but really it it should be more well known. I think it's a very good movie. Also bonus points to African American um, actors in it. Nina, um, Nina May McKinney and Clarence Muse and they don't play black stereotypes which is unusual for the era. So it is a very kind of progressive film. You'll have to um, decide about the ending for yourself. This film is from Jackie at Jacksboro on Twitter. Uh, actually, she asked two questions, but I'll, I'll do one, one at a time. Um, how did you take the path into reviewing slash writing about classic movies? So the um, origin story of my blog is um, around 2007, I found myself like absolutely enthralled with classic movies. And my friend and co-worker Frank was also into classic movies. And I was talking to him every single day about movies that I watched for the first time on like Turner Classic Movies and things I was excited about, actors and actresses I was really getting into, directors I was discovering. I have so much passion about this, I really need to get my thoughts down. Um, so I started a blog as kind of an outlet for that passion just to get my thoughts out there in some way. It started as kind of like um um, kind of like a fangirl blog. I wanted to be kind of light and fun about it, but then it got more serious when I started really researching, reading a lot of books about um, um, a lot of biographies, a lot of memoirs, a lot of books about um, different types of genres, and I really started to, to learn more about classic movies, and it became more serious after that. And her next question is, which actor slash actress would you most like to have dinner and drinks with while watching a classic movie, Mystery Science Theater 3000 style? Um, <clears throat> I don't like to talk about movies while I'm watching them. However, um, I don't want to pick an actor or actress in this case. I actually want to pick a director. Um, I want to pick Francois Truffaut. And the reason is, is because he was such a great um, lover of film. Like he had this um, almost overwhelming love for not only just filmmaking but actual film itself. He was, the, he was one of the biggest fans of movies who ever existed. So the next question comes from Peter at PM Bryant on Twitter. Who or what led you to become a classic film fan? So for that one um, I wasn't like I didn't get like a cultural education from my parents. Um, I didn't have like a grandma who introduced me to classic movies. For me, it came in college. In college, I was an English major and I took um, a film course as an elective. And I watched this movie, 
which should be no surprise to anyone who knows me, Out of the Past from 1947. And before that, I had watched um, The Quiet Man, and I was like, oh, well, I don't know if I want to watch classic movies. I don't really like this that much. And then I watched this one, and I was like, oh, so classic movies. I had this preconceived notion that classic movies were just like backwards and there's not going to have anything interesting for me. It's going to be too old fashioned. I wanted just new movies. So I watched this one. I was like, wow, this film is like dark and complicated. And um, I found that like, I mean, who are these people who are in this movie? Like, who is this Robert Mitchum guy? Who's Kirk Douglas? Who's Jane Greer? I like wanted to know more about them. And the movie's like so... Um, it, it draws you in, but then it like just totally like plays with your head. So I had to watch it again, and then I had to watch it again and again and again. And I was like, okay, I'll give classic movies a try. And um, in that class, I, I learned about classic movies, and I learned about more contemporary movies. And then I started watching um, TCM, and then I got totally hooked. So this is the film that did it. So the next question is from Daniel at Burl Lives Pipe on Twitter. Which classic, a film that is commonly thought among the pantheon of great old films, would you like to, would you most like to see remade and why? Um, so this, like, I mean, I'm not opposed to remakes. In fact, I just watched the remake of A Star is Born um, at the, at TIFF recently in Toronto, and I loved it. And I still have a great love for, for the 1937 version and for the previous versions. Um, but the remake I thought was really wonderful too. So I'm not opposed to remakes, but I don't gravit gravitate towards them. And I don't think films like Gone with the Wind or Casablanca need to be remade or Maltese Falcon or any of those big ones. However, I would make a case for Alfred Hitchcock's Suspicion from 1941. Um, that one, just because of the ending, and if you know that movie, you know what I'm talking about. It stars Joan Fontaine and Cary Grant, and Joan Fontaine is like this shy hair heiress, and she's like, um, she falls in love with Cary Grant's character, he's kind of like this wily charmer, and, um, it, she, um, as things progress, she thinks that he's going to kill her. And basically they had to fix that, because, no, Cary Grant couldn't be a killer, but that's really terrible because Cary Grant in that movie was such a great villain and I really wanted him to see him do something bad and uh, I just feel like that was just a sign of the times they didn't want to they didn't want to mess with audiences because the audiences love Cary Grant the way he was it's just it's a total cop out yeah. so it would be interesting if someone remade that and really went with the original ending um, which is where the movie was leading towards and maybe set it not, uh, even if they remade it, I would set it back in that era anyway. I think that would be really interesting. So that's my one, my one shot at a remake. So the next question comes from Lee at Totally Mac on Twitter and on YouTube too. She has a great YouTube channel. I'll leave a link down below so you can um, check it out. Highly recommend it. If you could go on a cross country road trip with three classic film stars, who would they be? Which type of vehicle would you take? And who would do the bulk of the driving? Just, that's a really cool question. Um, I don't know about vehicle, um, just something, something basic. Um, maybe I would let the person who's doing the bulk of the driving pick the car, possibly. So for that, I actually picked James Garner. I thought of three people, three people who were really good at driving. Um, I mean, there, there could have been a lot of other people who were good at driving, but these three people were, they love to drive cars. James Garner, Steve McQueen and Paul Newman. Now, um, Steve McQueen, I love him, but he probably wouldn't have been a really great conversationalist. So it was between James Garner and Paul Newman, and those two would be perfect, but I picked James Garner just because I love the Rockford Files, and we'd be all spending a lot of time together, and I want to ask him a lot of questions about that show. My next pick would be Lauren Bacall, because, um, she would have so many amazing stories to tell about being a movie star in the 1940s. I want to ask her about um, just that, and I would ask her about her, you know, relationship with Bogey. I mean, I think she would have a really great. Um, uh, I think she'd have a lot to to um, contribute to the conversation. So my third pick would be Roddy McDowell. Um, just on one level, super interesting guy 
very long career in movies and television from when he was a little boy to um, well into his adult years. But also he like he was like everybody's friend. Everyone loved him, including Lauren Bacall. I mean, like he had he had um, classic film stars over all the time. People confided in him. I feel like um, I, I feel like not only would he have a lot of interesting things to say, but he would add sort of like a very comfortable vibe to the dynamic in the car since we'd be in there for a long time. Um, so I would pick him. Another pick for that would also be, not a classic film star, but Robert Osborne. Imagine Robert Osborne in the car and they could just pick two Hollywood stars and you guys would just go on a long road trip. That would be amazing. So the next question is from D. Jarrett at D. Jarrett McCall on Twitter. And the question is, um, what do you think was the best year for movies? Um, I don't really have a strong answer for this because I just love so many different decades and um, years in the classic movie realm and I'm kind of keeping this from like the very beginning to like maybe the 1970s but I mean I feel like every year had something to contribute, some more than others. The gold standard for people is 1939 and I would not disagree with that mostly because my favorite film Bachelor Mother comes from that year. But then you have like Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind, you have so many great ones from that year. Um, but I mean, there's so many good ones like 1968, for example. The This year is the 50th anniversary of that year. And that year had The Producers, Planet of the Apes. It had Bullet, Romeo and Juliet. In fact, I actually wrote an article about some of the best films that came out that year. And I wrote it for the DVD Netflix blog and I'll leave it down, um, a link down to it below in the comments. Okay, the next set of questions come from Vanessa um, at CallMeVB on Twitter. So I'll, I'll just go through them one at a time. Which classic film actor or actress do you think would have made an awesome YouTuber? So my answer to this is actually pretty interesting. It's Debbie Reynolds. Um, I remember watching this little segment of hers where, I forget what film she had made, but um, she was just kind of giving a tour of like her home and she had showed a little portrait of, um, of Carrie and Todd and she was talking about how she loved being a mother and it kind of was like an insight in her being like a working mom. And I thought, wow, she could have been like a mommy vlogger. Like I, she was just so chipper and energetic. I could totally see her making like really fun videos to watch. Maybe like some recipe videos, some some videos about her, um, how she balanced um, work and motherhood, and maybe oh, like she would like tell some really great stories about her days in Hollywood. Um, maybe she could do some like song and dance numbers. Maybe I don't know. I just feel like. I feel like that could be real. That would be really cool. I think she had the charisma and energy that you need for a YouTube video. I do not have that charisma and energy, so I, that's why I admire it in her. And then Vanessa's next question is, what is your least favorite classic movie decade and your favorite? This kind of is similar to that other one about what is the best year for movies. Um, I don't have a favorite. I used to pick favorites. Um, and for a while I was like, I want the kind of almost tail ends of like the talky era in terms of classic movies like 1930s and 1960s. And I would kind of toggle between the those two. But I should love them all. I love the silence of the 1920s and the part talkies and those early talkies. I love the precos of the 1930s. I love the World War II movies of the 1940s. I love the the beautiful and like, you know, like how um, the beautiful like musicals and how like the 1950s started to get a little edgy and then the 1960s was breaking all the rules and oh, I just, every decade has something beautiful to See, offer. Maybe the one I like the least is maybe the 1970s, but I still like that decade. So it's not that I don't like it, it's just maybe it's not at the very top, it's maybe towards the bottom. I don't know. So um, her next question is, if you could unsee any classic film and watch it again for the very first time, which one it, would it be? Which is a really good question. Um, I actually kind of want to travel back in time to um, when I watched Out of the Past for the first time. And I want to 
kind of experience that again. <laughs> I want to go back to that year and kind of see exactly what my reaction was. Like what was I thinking when I watched this film for the first time? And I mean it would be interesting though if I could unsee this and see this in the first time for the first time what my reaction would be now in my 30s versus back then in my early 20s. So that could be cool. But I the next question comes from Nicholas at, at Nick Akmakjian on Twitter. I hope that pronounced that correctly. What classic movie that you love is one you feel is criminally overlooked by the general public? The one I pick is The Reluctant Saint from 1962. It's directed by Edward Dimitrik. It stars Maximilian Schell. He plays Giuseppe, who's kind of like a village idiot in like um, 17th century Italy. And he it follows his story as he um, becomes St. Joseph of Cupertino. Um, and so basically the film is about faith and doubt and prejudice and preconceived notions and um, closed-mindedness. It's really interesting and um, people just don't believe in him. Like Ricardo Montalban plays like a priest who just totally is like, what, what is this guy doing here? Because um, uh, Maximilian Schell's character starts to rise in the ranks of the local, of, uh, the, of the church, and he just doesn't understand. But then you have like um, Akim Tamirov who plays the cardinal and he sees something in Maximilian Schell's character and Leah Padovani plays his mom and she's like the one strong female character in the movie and it's the the movie suffers from being a religious movie so people will just cast it off oh it's just a religious movie so the historical biopic that has like that takes some artistic license with the truth kind of can be off-putting but if you just look at it as a movie, oh my goodness, it's so amazing. I'm not Catholic and I was just completely drawn into the story. And just amazing performances, really great storytelling. I just, no one talks about it, which kind of makes me mad. Um, <laughs> so that's what I would pick. Okay, the next question is from Eric at Sinatra's Rat Pack on Twitter. Well, this isn't really a question, this is more like a prompt. Um, so pick a decade of movies to send to the outer limits of the universe as a time capsule of what Earth best represents. Examples of why you chose that decade. So um, I'm not really good at prompts like this, but I gave it a shot. And I'm assuming that <laughs> the extraterrestrial being is not going to understand English. So I want the most visually and aesthetically appealing set of films I could possibly get. And then for that, I would pick the 1950s. And the reason I picked the 1950s is in, in that time frame in the history of Hollywood, Hollywood was, the studios were in competition with television. What could the studios offer that was different from those black and white TV shows? Full color, technicolor, cinemascope, like full spectacles of color on screen. So you have um, musicals like Singing in the Rain and Gigi and An American in Paris and films like Gentlemen Prefer Blondes which is just like they're all so visually stunning but then you have films like North by Northwest which is uh, a great thriller but it's just a visual masterpiece. So like the aesthetics of the 50s, personally my favorite in terms of like how everything looked. Um, and I just think it would it would um, please the eye. And if for any reason this alien could not see color, you could still have films like The Night of the Hunter, which does such amazing um, work with black and white. And that film is like eerie and creepy and does so many cool things with light and shadow. I mean, you could you could have a ball with the 1950s. So the next question comes from Kate Gabrielle on Twitter. And her question is, what are five classic films that you'd recommend to people to share with their friends when introducing them to the world of old movies? So um, I have some here. In fact, I actually wrote an article for the DVD Netflix blog as well, picking five movies that um, are kind of like gateway drugs for people who want to try classic movies. So I'll link, I'll link that down below, but I'll include uh, maybe a couple of, of movies that I mentioned in that blog post and then a few extra ones um, here. So The Apartment. This one, 
This is great because Jack Lemmon's character is just so lovable. You can't, <laughs> you can't not fall in love with this character. He is very sympathetic, but he's also just very sweet and you really want to root for him. And Shirley MacLaine's character is also one you empathize with, but she's also like much more complex and dynamic character. And this film is, this film could show people, show contemporary audiences that classic movies aren't simple. This looks like it could just be a romantic comedy about the workplace, but there's there's drama to it. It's got a dark edge to it. It's it's infinitely more complicated and more complex than you would think just a just a romantic comedy would be. Like this, this. and then if you want them to try um, a silent movie, you can't go wrong with what I call the holy trinity of silent comedy, which is. Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, and Harold Lloyd. And for this, not only is it like the, you know, I love workplace comedies, so that works with this. Um, and also like just the social situations, but the, the physical comedy is what's so enjoyable. And then people will recognize the, this famous scene and will have seen references to it in many places. And then they'll finally get the aha moment. Oh yeah, that's where that's from. And you can't, not enjoy safety less just very enjoyable so one film I used with my husband recently because I found that he was not watching a lot of classic movies with me and I was like oh, okay what can I show him that um, that will get him to, to like get back into watching classic movies with, with me like so Laura Laura um, it, Otto, Prem Otto Preminger's like fantastic film noir visually amazing the characters are super interesting um in in the actors like Jean Tierney and Dana Andrews and Clifton Webb and Vincent Price are all fantastic in it it's a beautifully told um mystery that just unfolds and you're just you just become entranced and everyone is obsessed with Laura and then the movie itself is like its own Laura because you started to become obsessed with the movie like Laura has an effect on people like a legit effect on people both the Laura in the movie and then the film itself so you can't you can't go wrong you can't go wrong with Laura and another sure hit would be the Thin Man movies, but not all of the Thin Man movies. You don't want to go maybe too far into the series where they stop drinking the martinis, but maybe like the first film, The Thin Man and After the Thin Man. Those two are great, and who would not love Myrna Loy and William Powell? I mean, they're just so good together. Um, everyone's going to want to be Nick and Nora. <laughs> <laughs> They're just so cool. They're such a fun couple and it's also a fun mystery to boot and Just anything with them together like double wedding, which is not a thin man movie, but it's hilarious I just you can't, really cannot go wrong. I feel like they are a timeless duo just absolutely timeless and then for my fifth pick I will pick anything with Humphrey Bogart in it <laughs> You just, whoever it is that you're introducing classic movies to, find out what kind of movies they like and pick a Humphrey Bogart movie that would match. Like, I'm going through the list here, like, The Petrified Forest would be good, High Sierra, The Maltese Falcon, um, To Have and Have Not, The Big Sleep, Dark Passage, Key Largo, Casablanca, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. They're all so good and he's so good in them and he's so iconic so people will recognize him. It just, you could not go wrong. You just basically pick one. I mean, okay, the next question comes from Mark at the underscore anim underscore com on Twitter. What is a popular, well liked classic film that you personally can't get into? Now, I mentioned this before, and it was The Quiet Man, John Ford's film with John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. And all three of them I generally like, and I really like Maureen O'Hara. I just did not like that movie. I, I, I think I watched it kind of at the wrong time. I thought basically it was old-fashioned and kind of overly dramatic and very sexist. I think the the scene that bothered me the most was when John Wayne has Maureen O'Hara over his shoulder and um, one of the local townswomen was like, oh, here's a stick to beat the lovely lady. And I know it's like a joke, but I just, that, that rubbed me the wrong way. 
Um, and I still, I mean, I, I, I totally appreciate where people are coming from when they say they love the movie. And I never, never ever try to tell people don't watch the movie, it's a terrible movie. Just, I just didn't like it. I just still don't like it. Carl at CKJ Sweeney on Twitter and just a shout out to Carl who runs an awesome podcast called The Movie Palace and I'll link it down below. I've been a special guest on the podcast. It's really great and I'll link to my episode as well so if you want to listen to it. What's an old film you've changed your mind on over the years for better or worse? So mine is The Wizard of Oz from 1939. Um, I didn't grow up watching it so I don't have that kind of childhood connection to the film. I watched it as an adult and I was like, mm, what? <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> what is going on? I don't get it. <laughs> um, I, I appreciated the visual mastery of it. It's just a stunningly beautiful film. I appreciate like where it fit in film history and the importance of it and the songs, like everything about it. Like I was, I was getting those elements but I could not connect with the story and I was very put off by it. I find like there's a there's a barrier for me to get into the film and really appreciate it for what it is. Um, Audible had released an A-list series of audiobooks, classics read by big Hollywood actors, and Anne Hathaway had read The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. And she did such an amazing job and I listened to a little clip of it and I was like, oh, okay, I'll listen to this. This sounds amazing. I really like how she was doing the voices and the narration. And so I read it as an audiobook and I got it. Like I was starting to get it. And then I came away from it and I was like, I love this book. And then I watched the movie and I was like, oh, okay, I understand it now. Like I get I get where this film I get where this film is coming from. I get the journey of the characters, I get the themes, like I like it broke that barrier that was up that wouldn't allow me to get into the movie. And also I was interested in something what director John uh, Waters had said in a documentary called These Amazing Shadows, which I highly recommend you watch. And he said he didn't understand why Dorothy wanted to go back to Kansas. Um, so I was like, oh yeah, that's really interesting. So I had that in mind when I was reading the book because I didn't quite understand that from the movie. And the thing is, is you gotta understand the, the, the time this comes from. It's a very patriotic message. I mean, like, there's, like, drab, um, kind of lonely, sepia, um, colored Kansas, and then there's, like, this beautiful, colorful land of Oz. Like, why would Dorothy go back to the drab K Kansas? And that's a very American patriotic message of, you know, like, there's the exotic and the other, and it might look really nice, but where you belong is in the best place in the world, which is America. Um, it's like, oh, I get it. And for an uh, audience from 1939, that would have been a message that really drove home. So I have a few more um, questions from Instagram. And the first one is Rachel at Corky and Klutzy. Um, and I love that username, by the way. She has two questions, actually. What is the first classic movie you fell in love with, and what is the first classic movie you remember watching? So, um, the first classic movie I fell in love with, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm not, I don't think it was the first movie I remember watching. I didn't watch many classic movies as a kid. I watched, um, a lot more TV, like I, like I was obsessed with Punky Brewster and stuff like that. Um, I do remember really liking Pollyanna from 1960 with Haley Mills. Um, it was it would be on TV once in a while, and I would always really really like watching it. So that could be it. Um, but if we're talking about like full on love affair, it was yeah, it was out of the past. And then the first movie that I remember watching, classic movie, was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs from 1937. They had re-released that in the 1980s um, in theaters, and I remember watching it with my mom. Um, at the cinnamon, Cinema 1 and 2 in Natick, Massachusetts. <laughs> um, the next question is from Daniel at Zilbernet on Instagram. What is the best way to get young people interested in classic movies? This is a really good question. So I think the key is, is that um, people have preconceived notions of classic movies. So you have to break through that. And young kids are going to have that too. I don't know where it comes from, but it comes from like, Classic movies, they're old-fashioned. Everything old is old-fashioned. 
So what you need is basically movies that have stood the test of time and that are able to speak from the past to people in the present. And that's hard to do because just because a movie is a classic movie doesn't mean it can stand the test of time. Classic movies suffer from racism, stereotypes, sexism, um, classism, all sorts of really kind of um, um, notions that we just have left behind and we're a much more progressive um, society now even though we still have issues but a lot of those issues were much stronger back then and um, you don't really have blackface now and <laughs> like there's a lot of things that are really really bad back then um, so you have to be careful in the content of the movie you're showing. It has to be something that's kind of devoid of those things. And you have some movies you can find and you start with those. And once they appreciate the, um, the aesthetics, the filmmaking techniques, once they get to know like actors and actresses and directors and different styles, I mean, as, as long as you get them hooked on good stories that can speak to them now, then you can get you can get them watching other things and then because they have enjoyed some things they'll be able to be more open-minded to stuff as long as you realize these are moments in history and we can't correct what they did in the past but we can just learn from them so the last question comes from chris at book builder on instagram in your opinion the best classic movie so i'm not going to answer this in terms of just one movie that is the best classic movie it's going to be more of a general um, definition of that. The best classic movie is a movie that transcends from the past into the present and speaks to you um, at what's happening in your life at that particular time. That to me is the best classic movie. If it can deliver a message of understanding and um, um, you can relate to it and it shows you something or opens up your mind, that's, a, that's the best classic movie. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions. These were really great and fun to answer. And I hope you liked my answers. Bye!